What's up, guys? It's just us today, just me. I'm gonna do a solo cast for you guys about building muscle. This is, I'm calling this your science-backed guide to building muscle, and I'm also gonna drop some wisdom bombs on you guys today of the many things that I've learned, both personally and especially professionally as a coach. Uh, before we get into the show, I do wanna tell you guys about Paluva shoes. Have you guys seen these shoes? Please tell me you follow Mark Sisson and Brad Kearns. They're just two of the most wonderful, insightful, walking the walk, educated, amazing health professionals in the biz. Absolutely love them. And uh, Brad offered to send me some Paluvas. I will be real. I said no twice to him because as you guys know, I've been wearing Vivo barefoot shoes for quite a while. And I wasn't too sure about the five toe design, like the toe separators. I was like, Oh man, I love you guys so much and they look awesome and I understand from like a science perspective what you're doing. I just, I'm good, thanks though. <laughs> and the third time Brad offered, I was like, okay, fine dude, I will try the shoes. I promise you I will give you my honest feedback though. And wow, okay, okay. I, as soon as I put them on, that's what I was saying. I was like, okay, okay, okay. They, they're actually absolutely amazing. And um, if you're not familiar with minimalist shoes, barefoot shoes, zero drop shoes, the idea is to mimic the natural movement patterns of our body as much as possible, right? So when we get into all these heel elevations and too much arch support and squished toes, that affects affects our biomechanics from the foot up, right? And so these shoes are designed to strengthen our feet, right? So instead of like getting weaker and weaker and weaker or being put in these positions that cause us to change how we walk from our natural state, we get stronger feet and more natural biomechanics. Um, I do recommend these and they recommend these for walking, right? Not, not really for, you know, if you're trying to do running and crazy type um, heavy loads of endurance workouts. Yeah, I mean, you could, could, but that's not how they're recommended. And you could get injuries, just letting you know if you like go too quickly from a big heel drop to zero drop shoes, right? So if you're going to do something like that, you need to ease into it. But for the rest of you, I highly recommend giving them a shot. And uh, Brad said that they would give me a 15% off code for you guys if you want to try them, which I think normally they only offer a 10% one. So you got the Coach Tara hookup, and that is the coupon code Coach Tara. Uh, I'll post about these in my on my social media platform so you can see them as well. But I'm absolutely loving them. So just wanted to pass that along to you guys. If you're hesitant like I was about the five toe design, just try them. Like really, really great shoe that they've created there. So. Um, you can uh, hit the link in the show notes or you can go to paluva.com and just enter Coach Tara to get that 15% off. Alrighty, let's get into the show, your science back guide to building muscle. So I'm going to be sharing all sorts of information with you guys from research. But before I do, I want to just drop a wisdom bomb on you guys. Like what I have found to be two of the biggest things that hold people back in getting muscle is first, and if you're already, you know, if you're already doing these, cool, we'll get into it deeper. But first is a lack of a consistent schedule, like being able to actually fit it into your life at a time that actually works. That is one of the biggest things like clients come to me. It's like, they're trying to do it in the morning and then the afternoon, or maybe the evening sometimes, or, you know, I'll do it on the weekend, but they don't really know when they're going to do it on the weekend, right? So being able to get it into a streamlined process of this works in my life to exercise at this time of day is so huge and underrated in terms of how important that is. So instead of putting it, trying to squeeze it in, work on making it go into a time of day that actually works for you, that you could do that any day for the most part, right? I understand some people have crazy work schedules that change, but figure it out, figure out how to get it on a predictable schedule. That is so huge because as we know, that consistency is really where the results come, right? Second, a lack of intensity, a lack of like really going for it. Like once you have actually learned proper form, you know, you're not going to hurt yourself. I see a lack of intensity, a lack of honestly effort, right? It's uh, going through the motions, like just kind of getting it done. Like that will really hold you back. And we're going to get into that in this, in this research that I'm sharing with you. But that is, those are two of the biggest things 
Um, and I'd say the third, obviously, is like insufficient protein intake, um, insufficient food intake, even, you know, if you're not eating enough, that can really hold you back. So those are a few little things to get you thinking before we get into this. Now, I am going to share with you information from an umbrella review. So an umbrella review is reviewing the systematic reviews and meta analyses, right? So meta analyses is reviewing a bunch of reviews, umbrella reviews are reviewing the reviews, right? So this is a lot of information. Um, this is from a umbrella review in 2022. So it's pretty recent. And um, they were looking purely at what actually gets hypertrophy or muscle growth. So hypertrophy is, is increase in muscle size. So that's what we're looking at in this umbrella review. And the variables that they looked at were volume. So the total amount of work that you do, frequency, how often you train, uh, concentric versus eccentric, like what really matters there. Uh, if you're not familiar, concentric is the lifting portion and eccentric is the lowering portion of a lift. Or you could think the hard or easy, but I don't know, a really slow eccentric is not easy. <laughs> uh, time under tension, right? So how long that rep takes um, with caveats, I'll get into it. Uh, exercise order, does that matter? Time of day that you train, does that matter? Periodization, how you design your training plan and blood flow restriction. Those are all the things I looked at. So let's get into it. Let's first look at volume, total amount of work. So I'm like, just, I've just summarized this for you guys. Okay. So here's the nitty gritty. They found that the ideal amount of volume, uh, per muscle group, uh, we're going to look at per muscle group per session and per week. Okay. So per muscle group, two to three sets per exercise led to the most hypertrophy. They found that four to six sets increasing your amount of sets. So you're doing, let's just say you're doing bicep curls. So instead of doing two or three, now you did six. They found that that did not provide any additional benefit. So I would stick with three. I think three is a really great number. That's why you see that so much in training plans, right? Um, and then in terms of per week, they found that 10 total sets per muscle group per week was the most optimal for hypertrophy. So I don't do that much anymore, but when I was first getting going, I, I probably was doing 10 total sets per muscle group per week. I will add a caveat to that is a lot of you may not be ready to have that much volume. That's a lot. Okay. So you got to work into that. Make sure you can recover because if you can't recover, you can't build muscle. All right. Um, I will add a caveat to this is that a limitation of the meta analyses that they used in this was that most of these participants were on untrained individuals. So it's hard to extrapolate that and compare it to trained athletes. So just know that as we go through this, a lot of this research was done on more newbie trainers. Okay. Trainees. <laughs> Okay. Frequency. So this means like, how often are you working out? It's a little confusing. Let me read this to you and then I'll, I'll look at, translate. Okay. It says the authors reported that a significant effect favoring higher frequencies was observed when volume was not equated. Okay. So meaning, um, they worked out more frequently, but that didn't mean that they started adding tons more volume in terms of how much work they were doing per week. Let me continue. This could be due to the fact that by maintaining the volume, increasing the weekly frequency allows maintaining the intensity of the effort, optimizing recovery between sessions. So to you know put that into reality for you, what we're saying what they're saying there is like let's say that you have, you know, let's say we're just only working biceps, okay, to make this simple, and you're going to do 10 sets of biceps work per week. Okay. So they're saying they, that in this example, it would be, it would be more ideal to do, uh, two sets, five days a week than doing five sets, two days a week. All right. So it doesn't mean you're going to work out five days a week and now you're going to end up with like 40 sets, right? They're saying like higher frequencies. They believe it could be because you can go more intense and it's not so much volume so that you can recover better between workouts. So yeah, 
that is kind of how I train. Um, I don't, I, I'm not doing the lifting portion of my gym work for like hours or something like that. It's maybe like 30, 45 minutes max of my actual resistance training time. Most of my time in the gym is spent walking and then cap it off with that. So that's an interesting thing to note, right? And I do train pretty frequently. I just don't go for a super long amount of time. So just sharing. Okay. Contraction type concentric or eccentric, right? So typically we've always, you know, if you're in the hypertrophy world, it's like, you got to have those like controlled eccentrics. It's all about the eccentric, the lowering part, right? And it is, but to really summarize like what they found here, the answer of like, which is better concentric or eccentric for hypertrophy was yes. <laughs> it was like both, both of them have importance in hypertrophy. So it's kind of like the, but, um, it was cool to see this and, and research, uh, especially more, more recent review of the research. Um, one thing that was really interesting that they found though, uh, is that they found this was from 2017 that consent, the concentric part of the lift, like the lifting part induced hypertrophy gains in the middle portion of the muscle while eccentric, the lowering part, had a greater effect on the distal portion, so like the ends of the muscle. And I found that interesting. Um, they think this is possibly due to localized muscle damage along the fiber produced by non-uniform muscle activation of eccentric con contractions. So kind of interesting, right? But yes, they're both important, but we do want to really highlight that eccentric control when we're thinking hypertrophy, meaning when you lower the weight or you're doing the easier quote unquote part of the lift, you want to control that if you want hypertrophy. Cause I see a lot of people fail to do that, especially when they're new, right? It's just kind of like lift the biceps curl and like, just let it like flop down. You don't want to let it flop down. You want to control. I always tell, I tell my clients push down, push it down, <laughs> right? To keep that tension in there. Okay. Next repetition duration. So we're looking at time under tension essentially here. Uh, so what they found was that um, it is ideal if you can train with loads less than 80 to 85% of your one rep max, so you can modify your tempo, right? So we, if you want hypertrophy, you don't want to be going like all out the heaviest lift you could ever freaking move because you want to be able to control it right? It's really hard to control it when it's the heaviest thing you could ever imagine lifting, right? Uh, two, they found similar gains in hypertrophy between half a second, which I don't understand how you could have a half a second rep, but apparently they did it. <laughs> similar gains in hypertrophy from half a second to eight seconds, meaning like the rep took you like one, two, three, four, up, two, three, four, right. You know, um, as long as they went to failure. <laughs> Whoa, cool. Right. So they found a similar, similar hypertrophy benefit kind of no matter how fast or slow you did your rep from half a second to eight seconds long, as long as they went to failure. So that's cool. And then they found that super slow reps, meaning over 10 seconds is actually inferior for hypertrophy. So you don't want to go too slow. And that makes sense. I mean, my speculation on that is that um, it could really decrease the uh, intensity in which you're lifting. Um, we're going to hit on the whole failure concept a lot throughout this. Um, but I will really say, uh, just from more of like the wisdom as a coach experience, most people, most of us, even me included, what we when we think we hit failure, Mm, that's debatable if we really hit failure or not. Like I have been in training camps amongst a bunch of coaches in which they have pushed me way past what I thought was failure. Like, I'm like, whoa, how did I do that? I, and I feel like I pushed myself pretty freaking hard already. So generally speaking, that's why like, you'll see me maybe on social media workouts, say just go to failure. Cause I know that that's for 99% of people, that's going to be more like close to failure. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go to exercise orders. Like, does it matter if you, you know, what order you do your exercises in? They actually found that it didn't. Well, let me say they found that they didn't have enough evidence to properly state any guidelines on this. Um, I will say like, if your coach has specified 
a, a specific order for you. Like, no, this matters. Like you need to do this, this activation. And then we're going to try to, you know, tire out your hamstring so we can fire in your glutes. Like if your coach has said, no, the order does matter. They're doing that for a reason. Um, but you know, just saying like, does it matter if you do your back before your biceps? There's not enough. We don't have enough data to say any of that matters currently. Time of day, real sweet and simple. They didn't find that it had any impact on hypertrophy, what time of day you work out in this umbrella review. So do what works for you. Um, I will add to the time of day thing though. Um, I have had clients where after work works really great for them. I've had clients where doing it on their lunch break works really great for them. Um, so if that does do it, you know, do what works for you. I will say that, um, the people who do it in the mornings and they really have that time carved out for them tend to have the easiest time with consistency because nothing gets in the way, right? It's like, no one's like bugging you usually at five 30 in the morning. Right. So just adding that, but do what works for you. All right. Periodization. I'm just going to summarize this really simply. If you want to read the umbrella review, I'll link it in there. Like I would say if more, if you're a coach, you might be interested in this because they're getting into like linear periodization and undulating periodization and, uh, you know, reverse linear periodization and all this stuff. But I feel like I'm going to just like make all of your eyes glaze over if I get too deep into that. So I will just summarize by saying this. Progressive overload and total volume are the biggest factors here. If you are progressing and continuing to challenge yourself at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. Um, so uh, there was, a, a, I will add a little note um, about reverse linear periodization. So it's heavy weight for low reps prog progressively gives way to less weight and higher reps over several weeks of months. This form of uh, cycling is really popular with bodybuilders and the research did confirm that that is effective. So just throwing that out there. Okay, um, blood flow restriction. So um, hopefully you're familiar with this. I really need, I don't know, have I not had an episode on blood flow restriction? I've got just the people I need to have an episode on that, but just so you know that they did find that blood flow restriction did, um, help with increases in hypertrophy and it's, let me get this. It says mainly when training programs last at least eight weeks and the cuff pressures are over one, 150, um, millimeter, millimeters of mercury MMHG. Okay. All right. That was, that's going to sum that up for our science backed hypertrophy in terms of how you are training. Now let's get into nutrition. Okay. So we'll call this part two. All right. Protein. So previously we believed that consuming more than 20 or sometimes people said 30 grams of protein in one sitting was redundant and that any excess would be wasted. And I dare say that anybody who like either like got into like kind of got in the bodybuilding world, like me or whatever was like, mm, I don't think that's true because I'm eating a lot of protein and it seems to be like working real, real well for me. <laughs> you know, I don't know if anybody can relate, but I was definitely kind of like, mm. I never really totally like, I, I didn't live like that. I was just like, mm, I'm going to eat a lot of protein <laughs> and I'm going to get into gut health. Okay. So if you're like a holistic practitioner and you're like, don't be one of those high protein people, don't worry. I'm going to talk about it. But Let's talk about what happened in 2023. So late 2023, you probably heard about it on social media. If you follow a lot of like, you know, muscle building, nutrition, sports type accounts like this, they completely debunked that whole, like you can only eat 20 or 30 grams of protein in one sitting. So, um, so this was really interesting. Let me just read this to you. Okay. Cause it's really, really fascinating. The study was a randomized control trial, widely considered the gold standard in research due to its controlled and double blind setup to achieve precise tracking. The researchers gave cows isotope amino acid infusions, which became incorporated into the milk proteins produced by those cows. Athletes were given different amounts of this traceable milk protein, allowing researchers to trace how amino acids moved through their bodies post-consumption. Remarkably, those who consumed 100 grams of protein had a 19% higher muscle protein synthesis rate over four hours and a 30% higher rate over 12 hours compared to the 25 gram group. 
only 15% of the excess protein was oxidized while 85% was utilized effectively, 100 grams of protein in one sitting. So crazy, right? So um, that being, so, so basically what I'm, why I'm sharing that with you is like, yeah, do you need to probably eat a higher protein diet if you are really going after it with hypertrophy? Yeah, because you're creating those demands and your body will start to crave it as you are creating those demands. Do I think somebody who's sedentary sitting on the couch needs to eat like super crazy high protein? No, because they're not creating the demand for it. Um, so yeah, eating sufficient protein and either, you know, optimizing that yourself or working with a coach to get that optimal can really make a difference in hypertrophy. Now for the part with gut health. So I've been um, doing microbiome. I use microbiome labs, uh, stool testing, uh, PS, you can't just like go get that. You have to work with somebody to get that. Okay. It's super confusing. Anyway, you would have no idea how to analyze the results. I've been working so hard and working with naturopathic doctors from microbiome labs, like getting deeper and deeper trained and understanding how to analyze these. But I will say as somebody who helps people grow muscle and has always advocated for higher protein, I have definitely learned that so many people cannot properly digest high protein and that can create a lot of problems in the gut. So how does, how can you know if like, maybe you don't get a test? If, if you're wondering if your gut is like all messed up and you're having like tons of like bloating, gas, like inflammation, like you need to get your gut tested. There are answers you can find out about that. Right. Like I just did an analysis for a client yesterday that's been like really trying to figure it out. And she's super histamine intolerant. Her histamines were through the roof, you know? So that's nice to know, right? It's nice to find out certain things like that. Certain bacteria are missing in your gut, right? So if you're having a lot of gut issues, like you should really invest in yourself on that, you know, get that resolved. But um, if you're not going to do something like that and you are eating a lot of protein, if you are getting protein farts, we joke about this, right? Like the, the sulfur smelling farts, it's like, hee hee ha ha. It's not funny. Actually, that is a warning sign that you are overproducing hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic to the gut in excess. And you don't want to be creating a bunch of ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, histamines, all these things that can happen when you can't properly digest your protein. Okay. So if you're having that happen, you either need to go find out what's going in on in your digestion and get that resolved, or you need to reduce your protein intake in the meantime. Okay. So there's a lot that can be done, but it's just like, it would, I, we, I would have to go on the biggest caveat ever. If I got, I'm like, Oh, well, we can talk about stomach acid and bile release. And then, you know, do you have SIBO and like, you know, isn't it an enzyme thing and what's going, I can't, you know, I'm not going to go into that big of a tangent. Maybe I can do a whole nother episode on gut health if you guys want, but that just saying, if you're eating a high protein diet and it's really messing up your digestion, you need to look into that. Okay. I would at least start with some betaine HCL and digestive enzymes and go from there. But that's all I'll get into for now. Okay. Eating at a surplus. Let's talk about that, right? For muscle gains. So um, this comes from an article from Alan Aragon in 2020. Um, I'll link that in the show notes. Um, and it's the name of the article is magnitude and composition of the energy surplus for maximizing muscle hypertrophy implications for bodybuilding and physique athletes. Okay. So that's who this is geared towards, but there were some interesting takeaways in here. Um, so, uh, from, he has, this is, let me see here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking at a table of his, his energy surplus guideline summary. So he has this for untrained or novice or deconditioned people, trainees, or for more trained and advanced people. And, um, what he says in here is that protein is optimized at, about, um, uh, he's doing this in grams per kilogram. Well, some of you guys use that. So about 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram, um, for you pound people, that's roughly one gram per pound. It's about 0.7 to one, um, additional consumption beyond this amount seems likely to be unnecessary to maximize the hypertrophic perfect response. I don't say that word a lot, apparently to training. <laughs> All right. So, um, he's basically saying like about a gram per pound or in that 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram. Um, he has not found that that is necessary, um, in order to achieve hypertrophy. 
Um, and I will quote this. He says, by default, an energy surplus for mass building should center around higher carbohydrate intakes, which can include varying portions of protein, depending on how cautiously one wants to court the potential for concurrent fat gain. Um, I, uh, so yeah, I mean, if you are insulin sensitive, you know, you don't have, um, you're, you're not diabetic, you don't or have, you know, prediabetes or just have insulin resistance and you're like really going after hypertrophy, you know, you're able to utilize carbohydrates. Like I'm also an advocate. If you can handle carbohydrates and you want to build muscle, you eat more carbs, healthy carbs, potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, you know, um, all of anything from nature that has carbs. Um, I would really consider putting that into your diet. If you want to build mass, you know, I've been in, as you guys know, I've been in the keto world for a long time and can you build muscle on keto? Yes. But like, I have to admit every time I would see, kind of see some of those guys that are like, look, I'm like, dude, but yeah, but just imagine how much more muscle you'd have if you ate carbs. Yep. Just being real. That has like definitely gone through my mind. And that depends, right? If you're, you know, have issues with blood sugar and blah, 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 then no, you know, that's probably not going to do you favors. Um, but in general, healthy, you know, healthy body, you can handle carbs. Yeah. You want to increase your carbs and your proteins. You want to go really kind of carb protein heavy, you know, with moderate amounts of fat that you need for vital functions. If you really want to hyper, uh, prioritize hypertrophy. Um, all right, let's talk about Jose Antonio's work. Cause this is just so interesting. Um, definitely one of the most like interesting studies in my opinion, this is back from back in 2014. Um, the name of the study is the effects of consuming a high protein diet on body composition in resistance trained individuals. So this comes from the journal of the international society of sports nutrition. And this is in people who were actually already trained, right? They're, they're experienced, they're advanced. So all experienced lifters, one group had extra calories in the form of protein. So they ate more calories purely from protein. They ate 4.4 grams per kilogram per day of protein. So for, you know, you pounds people, that's two grams of, uh, protein per pound of body weight per day. Okay. The other had the generally recommended 1.8 gram per kilogram, or that would be 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. Right. Um, and they found that there were no significant changes over time or between the groups for body weight, fat mass, fat free mass, or percent body fat. So there wasn't a huge change in any of that. Okay. So, which was interesting. Um, but what is interesting is while they didn't gain more muscle, they also didn't gain more fat despite eating hundreds more calories per day coming from protein, which, you know, if you have dived into pro protein. Um, we have to burn a lot of calories just to digest protein. It's also not a direct energy source for the body, right? Fat and carbs are. So between like it being more difficult for your body to even turn that into energy or calories, plus the, uh, thermogenic effect of eating protein and like burning calories just to digest it. That doesn't surprise me too much. So anyway, just throwing that out there, basically what I'm trying to say, eating at a surplus is like, yeah, you do want to, um, at least make sure that you are at least eating what your body needs in order to perform. And maybe like some slight surpluses here and there are going to help you out with muscle building, right? If you are just like restricting calories, like crazy, it is possible to still build muscle and lose fat. It's just, it's just going to be more difficult. So you kind of want that sweet spot, right? Where it's like, I'm not like eating some crazy excess here, um, you know, to build, add more body fat, but I am eating enough to perform and recover and like stay there and you'll be on your way. Okay. All right. Part three of this thing we got, I've got a couple more things here. Sleep. We can't not talk about sleep if you want to build muscle about 75% of your growth hormone for the entire day is produced during slow wave sleep, which is deep sleep. I'm going to repeat that about 75% of your growth hormone for the entire day is produced during deep sleep. 
So if you're not getting deep sleep and you are not building muscle, da, 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 that is what needs to be addressed. I have had clients where I'm like, okay, cool. This guy trains really well. He eats really well. He's got good family relationships. Like, yeah, he may have like a high stress job, but he, his mindset's good. He's managing that well. How's your sleep? Oh, well, maybe you're not managing your stress well. Okay, cool. We're going to go all in on getting more deep sleep, right? Because I know that that will turn the needle when they're doing all the other things right, right? So um, let's see how to get more deep sleep. Okay, number one. And let me, for those of you who have struggled with this for a while, let me just say, I understand your pain. I know that some people um, just kind of genetically get more deep sleep than others. I'm acknowledging that, but that doesn't mean that you can't change it. I have done this with so many clients and I will add, there is a huge mindset component to this. There are things that you are not addressing in mindset, most likely, and there's like stressors that are keeping your body on like way more high alert than it needs to be. That is often the case. And also mindset in terms of relationship with sleep, not stressing about sleep and like getting into that. And then there also can be like hormone or chronic inf inflammation things going on too. So you need to go deep both in the mindset and in the you know physiological body and see what's going on there if this is like a really big problem for you okay so in general how to get more deep sleep go to bed and wake up at about the same time every day that is a game changer if you're not doing that one thing and you're not getting a lot of deep sleep that's your work just start there it's called free <laughs> it's free you'll feel amazing your body won't be as confused it knows what to do so go to bed and wake up about the same time every day is conducive to getting more deep sleep cold room warm blanket absolutely heat is a massive disruptor to sleep and if it's you know too cold and you don't got that warm blanket that's going to wake you up too dark dark room um don't eat before bed not only because it will dampen recovery your ability to recover because your body's trying to digest food but also it heats up your body heats up your core body temperature and what did i say was a disruptor to sleep heat so don't eat right before bed wait two to three hours cut it off you, you you're good you'll live till tomorrow um next number five get proactive about any pain Pain is a huge disruptor to sleep. And for those of you dealing with chronic pain, I send you all my love and all my compassion. And I know you have tried a lot of things. And my message for you is do not give up. Do not give up. Keep looking. Okay. And if you do have some, you know, temporary pain thing and you're not sleeping well, get proactive about it. Sometimes we get over-reliant on our body's ability to heal. But if it's like not healing, like go help it out so you can get some good sleep again. Uh, six, remove disturbances. So pets, I mean, I'm not going to tell you your business. I'm just going to tell you I've, I've worked through this with clients and it is a game changer. It's like, oh, but my dog always sleeps with me. I couldn't do that to them. I totally get it. I love doggy so much, but like if they are waking you up a lot at night, like it is massively taken away from your quality of life and your health. So consider that. Okay. And if you have like a snoring partner that's waking you up all night, consider earplugs or something, some sort of solutions there, okay? Because that is not good for health, being woken up all night. If you got a baby, much love, you'll, you'll make it through this phase, okay? <laughs> all right. Um, number seven, begin stress management practices like meditation, mindfulness, mindset coaching, therapy, makes a big difference. And then like I already mentioned, address hormone and our chronic inflammation issues. All right. So we want deep sleep. You want deep sleep. If you want gains, you would need deep sleep. Okay. Figure you don't give up. You can figure this out. Okay. <laughs> and if you need help, obviously, you know, there's me or many other coaches who can help you. Part four, recovery. All right. So you got to stretch. When I talk to, when people think like stretching, they look at stretching as um, this, like, that would be a nice thing to do for myself. Like, it's almost like going to the spa or like getting your nails done or something. It's like, oh yeah, that'd be good. No, dude, if you don't stretch, you're not going to get as many gains. It's imperative, especially when you're lifting weights, because if you can't take a joint through its range of motion, you can't take a muscle through its range of motion because one of your joints is all messed up. How are you supposed to get proper gains on that muscle? when you can't even move it right, right? So we've you have to stretch in order to get gains. 
and obviously make sure so you don't get hurt. It, the more you're putting demand and load on your body from lifting weights, the more you increase the likelihood that something could get dysfunctional. So you have to do this. This is part of being an athlete, part of being a resistance training human being. You have to stretch. I like dynamic stretches before, static stretches outside of the workout window. You could do them after. Okay. And I personally recommend yoga to a lot of my, not, not a lot, all of my clients. I recommend one day of yoga per week because I find it hits a lot of birds with one stone, both in flexibility and mobility and in calming their nervous system and, you know, having a moment with themselves and there can be some healing type stuff that happens there too. So, um, if you have a skilled yoga instructor, yoga, it's just amazing. Um, also, on recovery. If something hurts, get proactive. Don't just wait for it to get better. I mean, sure you can a few days or whatever, but if it's persisting, you need to go do something. You need to get a sports massage or go to a chiropractor or physical therapist or something. Get proactive about those injuries. Okay. Um, next, make sure you're not training on sore muscles. If your muscles are still sore, they are probably not fully recovered. So just wait until they feel good again to train those. Um, and last on recovery, this is a big one. Whenever I post about this, like I find people are kind of like, really? Like, and I'm like, yes, really? Yes. So if you feel absolutely drained, like you just can't even see straight, like you just like, Ooh, body's just like low energy. Don't lift weights that day. Don't lift weights that day. Just go for a walk, go to bed early, look at it as hyper recovery, and then get in there when you feel good. We don't want to be adding big, heavy loads to our body when we're barely making it as is, okay? And if that's a chronic problem, then we need to take a look at like what's going on in life, in our lives, and figure out what we can shift there so that doesn't have to be such a big problem constantly. I mean, that's a big reason a lot of people hire me is they're just not feeling great and they're not totally sure why. And every time... Every time I have a client like that, there is an emotional side of that big time. And usually some lab result type stuff as well. Um, and last, um, just I'm calling this part five troubleshooting. Other causes of poor results in hypertrophy, nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. If your energy production is low and you don't have proper mineral status, and you can't, your methylation cycle, this like cycle that goes through our body that kind of makes everything work, can't work right and all that, you're not going to be able to get optimal hypertrophy. So I'm talking blood labs, hair mineral analysis, even some of the DNA analysis stuff that I do, I've been able to see like, oh, wow, this person's really high risk on MTHFR, which is folate, for example. So their, their blood, their serum levels of folate are going to need to look higher than the normal reference range for them to actually have as much as they need for energy production, right? That's just one example. Um, hair mineral analysis. Oh, you have brain fog and fatigue a lot. Well, guess what? You have some heavy metal toxicity. So let's start working on getting that drawn out of you. And da -da -da -da, you can think straight, your energy levels go up, you can perform better in the gym, right? Or maybe you're really magnesium deficient or, you know, some of these uh, minerals that are highly correlated with thyroid health. Okay, cool. Well, if your metabolism can't work well, then it's going to be hard to get optimal results in hypertrophy for sure. And a lot of other things that are even way more important than that. Um, inflammation, inflammation can really hold you back. So stool tests and blood labs, those are my favorite way to ways to find inflammation uh, in my clients. Also Dutch test, uh, it's a hormone, stress and hormones. It's both saliva and urine. I can find some big indicators of inflammation through that test as well. Um, imbalanced hormones. So yeah, the Dutch test, um, hair mineral analysis, though I like to see those on most of my clients who are having like big mood energy, something maybe for women, like menstruation's not going super well. Um, they're not sleeping right. They're feeling dependent on like alcohol or substances to like make them feel better. Like it's usually something going on there. So sometimes you need to troubleshoot, even with something like hypertrophy is like, why isn't this working? We need to go deeper. You know, if you've tried all the obvious things and 
that's not getting you there and you're, you, you know, you're pushing it, you know, you're eating high protein, you know, you're sleeping well, you like you're consistent and like, it's still not going well. There's usually something deeper going on. So, um, just an encouragement to find out what that is. Um, and of course, um, I mean, I'm like, I usually have a somewhat full client tell, but depending on when you hear this, if you're interested in having me help you with those things, obviously that's, this is what I do. Training, nutrition, mindset, biohacking, and finding out what's going on and how do we optimize and thrive. So, um, I will, I'll put my, um, uh, info page for hire. That's my, uh, one-on-one coaching, you know, so you can see what that involves and if you're interested in that. Um, and yeah, hopefully that's been helpful to you guys. Uh, I'd love to hear any feedback from you. So all, you know, always, always let me know if there's another solo cast that you guys would like me to do another topic, or if there was anything in this that you were confused on or would like clarity on, I could always make a post about that or DM you directly. So just, you know, hit me up on either Instagram, TikTok, or not TikTok. Don't DM me on TikTok. I won't see it. DM me on Instagram or Facebook <laughs> and I'll get back to you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a beautiful day. Mm-hmm.